yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we could give less chemotherapy? Heinz, I mean, when, when you and I first started practicing, the book said maybe a year of adjuvant yeah. chemotherapy. Before that, it was 18 months. And then finally, a study says six months where we've been kind of stuck. We, we're fixated on this 12 cycles yeah. of, of adjuvant chemotherapy. What are you doing? So I think um, this is probably the most exciting research going on right now for stage three disease is to see is six months really necessary? Uh, maybe shorter times of duration of adjuvant chemotherapy mm. may be enough. And I think we should be very proud and very excited about the international global efforts to actually address this question because you need large patient volume in order to answer this important question. Can we be as successful with three months versus six months. The European colleagues help us in the US, a big intergroup where we address exactly this question, three versus six months. And I think it's very important to advance. Do we really add with extra three months of treatment only maybe toxicity and not more efficacy? And I think that will help us in the future to decide. Now, the question still remain, will Fall Fox the best treatment for the future? Because we have seen in the last two years our new drugs, the target agents, have disappointed. And I think this will bring us back on a drawing board. What do we have to do different to further increase our efficacy if we decide it's three months of treatment? So I think there will be very exciting, challenging uh, things in ahead of us in order to really nail down the events leading to recurrence and efficacy uh, with adjuvant treatment. Axel, very basic question. You're giving a patient adjuvant chemotherapy, Folfox recipe, mm -hmm. cycle six. Patient comes back in with a little persistent neuropathy at this point. How do you manage that? Persistent between cycles? Yeah, so yeah. they come in uh, that day with a little bit of numbness. So, I mean, the good news is that if and when I communicate uh, the efficacy of adjuvant therapy to my patients. I always tell them, you know, two-thirds of the efficacy is carried by the fluoroprimidine, whether it's capecitabine or 5-FU, and one-third is carried by oxaplan. And uh, this actually makes me feel better in, in these cases, talking to patients about dose reductions and even omitting oxaplan from future cycles. We also have to keep in mind that if you look at the Mosaic trial and other trials that put oxaplan on the map in in adjuvant therapy, there was not a 100% dose intensity, you know, that was maintained over all cycles in all patients. It's actually a rare event that we can really put a patient through 12 cycles of adjuvant FOFOX. I also believe that physicians routinely overestimate the contribution of oxaplatin to adjuvant therapy in stage three, in particular in stage two. So instead of pushing all the way to that cycle 12, adding calcium and magnesium, this sort of stuff, back off? You know, I do back off. And I, coming back to what Heinz said, I mean, if once we have, hopefully at some point, we'll have the data showing that six cycles of fall fox or three months of therapy in general is not inferior to 12 cycles, meaning six months of therapy, this will actually be very, very helpful for patients. Less toxicity, financially a very a blessing for a lot of uh, countries and people. Yeah, Henning, let me kind of come back to the question you raised uh, in your opening comments around stage two. I think this is the hardest patient I take care of right now, um, is what to do with these patients. And at least in Washington, D.C., where I practice, you <laughs> offer 3%. There's a lot of takers for 3%. Right. Um, what's your take on the incorporation of oxaliplatin in stage two versus just the fluoroperimidine? Yeah, we had data from the Mosaic trial that uh, certain clinical parameters uh, uh, um, were poor prognostic factors, such as T3, T4, perforation, high CA levels, um, also, you know, the, the, these, these uh, parameters. And, um, and there had been a subgroup analysis retrospectively undertaken that indicated that these patients might benefit from Fall Fox uh, in terms of progression-free survival. Now, unfortunately, uh, this did not hold true when we saw the updated data uh, on this. So um, I tend to be more reluctant, actually, to offer oxaliplatin in stage two uh, patients here. And I would discuss that, um, as has been said before, most of the benefit is probably coming from furopimidine alone. And the price of having a, a potential small benefit, which is not proven, is for the neuropathy that we buy with that. So 
I tend to be more reluctant and offer a fluoropyrimidine alone in this setting. So I'm the same way, and, and Metaport's in my shop, so the difference here is oral, here's some oral chemotherapy for a few months uh, that's pretty easy versus the other, which is neuropathy and Metaport's. Do <coughs> others feel strongly about oxaloplatin in that sort of average risk stage two patient? The average is clearly not. I mean, what I when I l approach a patient with stage two disease, I look at h really clear high risk factors, for instance, at stage four B, you know, a patient with tumor invasion into different or into adjacent organs, and I think Johanna already mentioned that, that uh, these patients actually have at the worst prognosis but let me than some of the stage on. three patients. But so jumping on that, I mean, if you go back to Mosaic, even that group doesn't benefit, though, This right? group actually did have DFS benefit. PFS. They have yes. DFS, yeah, yeah, but not overall survival benefit. Now, the group was not, it was, of course, not in any way power to, uh, to really identify, you know, whether there, whether there is a definitive survival benefit, in particular now that we have to wait about six or more years to really see a survival benefit because our palliative therapy is so good. So I do believe they are a very select group of patients in stage two, high risk factors, let's say few numbers of lymph nodes identified, as I said, which could be a biologic uh, factor itself uh, that might be candidates for oxaplan. But otherwise, I uh, use fluoropyrimidine or fluoropyrimidines or actually you know, if you have adequate number of lymph nodes resected, it's a T in the garden variety, T3, N0, 20 lymph nodes negative, no other risk factors. Back off. Leave them alone. Don't Send do them any. back to the yeah. country exactly. of Minnesota, right? Yeah, exactly. If Go I may on. jump into here, yeah. I think uh, discussing adjuvant treatment is also discussing uh, competing risks. So we have to keep in mind that in some patients, the risk of dying of cancer is lower than the risk of dying of another disease. So and this is especially true for, for patients who are growing el uh, older. Yeah. So if you, if you discuss adjuvant treatment stage two for a 70 year old who might, have, who might die from cardiovascular disease to a higher extent than from colon cancer. So there's no use of reducing the risk yeah. of from colon cancer by 3%. So we have to be good physicians and balance these competing risks. I agree that this is all about risk and evaluation. So it's actually funny in my practice, I see patients from Las Vegas when we turn down the risk for and uh, evaluate two versus three, four percent, they have no problems to make a decision. That's what they live by. But I think, <laughs> I think, I think only in they the gamble. future. Yeah, they gamble, <laughs> and I think that's what where the difficulty comes in. It's the longest consultation. But I think in the future, and we are starting to understand what the patients are who recur. We we are now starting, and I think we probably talk about the microcytic instability. What markers can we go beyond pathology in order to help us guide patients and us where treatment is really appropriate or not. I mean, that's perfect, Heinz, because I think that's really what we need, of course, Johanna. I mean, so if I could look at a patient and say, you're not going to have a recurrence, so go away. Um, <laughs> you're going to have a recurrence, and chemotherapy will help. Or sadly, you're going to have a recurrence, and chemo's not going to help. Right. That's really what we need to know. Where are we with gene testing in early stage colon cancer that may help us in that way? So that's the biggest question. Can we identify now with newer methods ways to determine who's at higher risk of recurrence, but more importantly to what you just said, not only you may be at a higher risk of recurrence, but will chemotherapy actually help? And I think that's the biggest question. So I think our strongest data is actually looking at microsatellite instability or um, patients who have a high microsatellite instability or are MMR uh, deficient. We have seen uh, through retrospective analyses from uh, stage two trials that they are probably resistant to fluorouracil therapy, and they actually might have an, an inferior survival if they are treated with adjuvant therapy. So those are the folks that are probably not gonna receive in stage two any sort of benefit from adjuvant therapy. So that's the number one test that we need to do on these stage two And are patients. you doing that in your patients before you make decisions? Absolutely, I will not make a decision, and actually it, it means that I don't have enough to tell the patient mm -hmm. and lead them down the guidance of, of whether or not they sh should receive therapy. Because I think if I find that they're microsatellite high, that's a much different conversation right. than if they're microsatellite stable. And are you finding, like I am, that this is very confusing to the general oncologist? They're, they're, the language is difficult. Yes. They're not really sure what to do with this. Right. And I'm even seeing on PATH reports you know, that a pathologist without gene testing saying looks like an MSI high tumor. Right. Are you all seeing this? Absolutely. You have to get it tested 
tested. That's the most important part. And then it ties into the whole Lynch syndrome question, too. If you see that on a pathology report, that should automatically trigger you to think about a genetic abnormality. And then it leads to further testing down the road that it's hard to keep track of as we make these advances. Yeah, so Axel, you know, we, this test is part of it. What about gene profiling? Where are we with that in yeah, colorectal cancer? You know, as Rohana said, you know, MSI, the role of MSI or deficient mismatch repair of phenotype, I think it's pretty well established in, in stage two. Now the, uh, the million dollar question is, can we develop gene signatures, molecular profiling tests that will give us solid prognostic but also predictive information. This patient will have that risk of recurrence and will benefit or not benefit from chemotherapy. That's the, and you know, there have been attempts, of course, you know, actually various gene signatures are available right now, commercially available, um, uh, like Oncotype DX, Coloprint, et cetera. Um, I personally do not necessarily use them in my clinical practice because I feel confident, I mean, it's uh, to make a risk assessment for patients based on, you know, what Henning said, for instance, competing risks of dying, uh, the initial pathology stage. I do use MSI in stage two. Um, the added benefit for me is not that apparent once you are really uh, sure about these prognostic markers because the Oncotype DX test, for instance, doesn't give you predictive information. And that is the critical issue. We, we get a better refined assessment of prognosis Perhaps. I mean, it's more or less an educational tool for oncologists out there who are not as embedded as we are in colon cancer, but it, it still doesn't help us to decide is this the patient who benefits from that chemotherapy. Heinz, you're like the molecular profile guru of our group. So, are you, is this something you're uh, so, using? On yeah, I, I do it routinely. I've sat down with our pathologist. It will be done on all stage two and three diseases. Oncotype DX? No, no, no. MSI. No, so MSI. let's go to the profile. Okay. okay. So, the profile, I don't use it because I don't think it is very helpful to distinguish. Are they the wrong genes, you think? Or is it just not valuable? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think, think it's the wrong genes. I think that it's not easy with genetic signatures to really identify easy prognostic, you know, because we, we had the same dilemma in breast cancer. The signatures are not the same. There are prognostic genes which I think are traveling along but not functionally really explaining the recurrence. So I think there is a lot of confusion going on uh, how this can be used and, and Johanna pointed out they are not reflecting benefit of treatment the slight increase of risk will not translate into a treatment benefit. So I think it's very confusing and we do not use it like I think the rest of the panel. You know, the, the other concern is we have three to five tests, uh, if I'm right, and we don't know whether the, each test is picking the same uh, patient who has a poor prognosis. So in one test, mm -hmm. a patient may be turned out, or may be uh, um, classified as being having a poor prognosis, but in the other test, he may have a, a good prognosis. We don't know these data. And if they are so critical in taking treatment decisions, I would like to see more data on this. And consistency across yes. us. I mean, if yes. you look at uh, PATH guidelines versus Oncotype versus Coloprint, yeah. you can sometimes get non-concordant you know, concordant what do you do? results. And yes. then which one do you yes. believe, yes. right? Yes, yes, And I think uh, it's, uh, the, the whole development of the signatures also reflect that maybe we are dealing with stage two and three disease with two different diseases. It's not naturally that you kind of progress one into other. The signatures are completely different. Uh, one would not apply to the other. So I think we are scratching only the surface, understanding what happens and what is responsible for the recurrence for stage two versus stage three disease. I want to shift gears just a little bit.